Hello and welcome to this Nestle Nutrition Institute World Microbiome Day. The, the title of my presentation is Targeting the Cat Microbiota to Reduce the Risk of Disease. Where are we now? My name is Hania Szajewska, I'm professor and chair of the Department of Pediatrics at the Medical University of Warsaw, Poland. My scientific heart belongs to a number of organizations but especially to ESPEGAN, European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Pathology and Nutrition, and ISAP, International Scientific Association for Probiotics and Prebiotics. Microbiota, microbiome. We are in the midst of the microbiome revolution. As one of our colleagues said, not a day goes by without some new revelation on the potential role of the gut microbiome in some disease or disorders. And indeed, when you think about the pathogenesis of almost all the diseases, now the um, microbiota is considered as playing a very important role. But the patient, the patient doesn't care about our science. What he or she wants to know is, can we cure him or her? Can we prevent diseases? Here on this slide, I summarize some of the factors influencing neonatal colonization, because as a pediatrician, I'm very much interested in microbial programming. And we know that uh, factors such as duration of gestation, mode of delivery, mode of feeding, environment, the use of antibiotics are extremely important for microbial programming. And if everything goes right, that it results in intestinal homeostasis, healthy metabolism, immune tolerance but things can go wrong. It may be preterm delivery or C-section, there may be no breastfeeding, uh, there may be hospitalization, the use of antibiotics or other drugs. And each one of them may result in dysbiosis of the gut microbiota. And dysbiosis is a term which describes alteration in the number and in the function of the microbiota. And we know that dysbiosis contributes, and I, I already told you that it contributes to a number of diseases. Some of those are shown on this slide. One of the factors which is of special interest to me is the use of drug and especially antibiotics. All over the world, we see overprescription of antibiotics. These are recent data from the United States. Look in this observational trial, a uh, study of more than 14,500 children, 70% of those received at least one antibiotic prescription during the first two years of life. And it, this is not without the consequences. There's increased risk of asthma, allergic rhinitis, atopic dermatitis, celiac disease, overweight, obesity, etc. Of course, all of the, these kind of studies are showing association. They do not prove causation, but they are extremely important that we may are be doing with the use of antibiotic some harm. So, so what can we do for the targeting the gut microbiota to reduce the risk of disease? Of course, reduce the factor negatively affecting the gut microbiota. And one of the examples, of course, not the only one, but one of the examples is the use of antibiotics. People are also interested in strategies to modulate the gut microbiota. And on this slide, I summarized some of those uh, uh, strategies. The, one of the factors which has a tremendous impact on the gut microbiota is diet. In case of children, of infant, it's of course breastfeeding, which has really important impact with a promotion of, of um, bifidobacteria because of the presence of the um, human milk oligosaccharides. One of the strategies is also the use of biotics. And uh, I'm calling your attention to biotics and four important papers, a consent to statements which were uh, published by ISAP in Nature Reviews, Gastroenterology and Hepatology. All of them are open access and there are two recent reports, one on symbiotics and one on postbiotics. But in my presentation, I would like to focus on probiotics because this is the area of my interest. There are many indications for using probiotics in children, but I would like to focus on three of them and I will explain why I have chosen those three. Let me start with respiratory tract infections. 
And the reason I'm focusing on respiratory tract infection is that because of the COVID pandemic, there is a huge interest in probiotics, in stimulating the immune system, especially in virus respiratory tract infection. This is recently published narrative review. A number of systematic reviews with or without meta-analysis were identified. And overall, the conclusion is that probiotics could be beneficial in upper respiratory illnesses without specific etiology. One of these meta-analyses which is included in this narrative review is a systematic review, Cochrane review, which looked at probiotics for preventing acute upper respiratory tract infection. They are of interest for us because they are mainly caused by viruses. Viruses uh, cause 90% of acute respiratory diseases. Cochrane, this Cochrane review identified 12 randomized control trials with more than 3,700 participants, children, adults, and elderly. And here are the main findings. So compared with placebo, probiotics at the group, reduce the number of participants experiencing acute upper respiratory tract infection, reduce the mean duration of an episode of acute upper respiratory tract infection, reduce antibiotic use. This is extremely important. I told you what are the effects of using antibiotics and reduce in children cold-related school absence. You may be interested what the effect size, so this comes from the Cochrane Review, a 47% reduction for experiencing one or more respiratory tract infection. So the effect is here. As pediatrician, we are more focusing on children. So this is more recent systematic review and media analysis, 23 randomized control trials, more than 6,000 participants. Again, there is reduction of subjects, a number of subjects who had at least one respiratory tract infection. And of course, we know that not all probiotics are equal. So here you see the results that some of those probiotics are more, more effective than others. The question is, what is the antiviral mechanism of probiotics? Um, exactly when it comes to other mechanisms of probiotics, it's not completely understood, what, but what is discussed in the literature is that probiotics upregulate antiviral factors, that they increase clearance of infections from respiratory epithelium, increase regulatory T cells, and decrease pro-inflammatory cytokines to attenuate inflammatory responses and disease severity. This was in probiotics and respiratory tract infections in general. Of course, interest in probiotics and COVID-19. This is a statement made by ISAP already more than a year ago, but it's still true. There are no shortcuts. There is currently no evidence that any kind of probiotics can protect from COVID-19. However, studies are ongoing. And this is a recent summary of clinical trials of probiotics to prevent or treat COVID-19. And one of them, the protocol of which was just published, is of special interest, I think. It's a large trial with more than 1,000 subjects, starting from uh, the age one. Subjects having a household contact who has recently, so not for more than seven days, were tested positively for COVID-19 as they would be randomized to daily oral LGG or placebo for 28 days. And the hypothesis is that taking LGG as a probiotic will protect against COVID-19 infection and reduce the severity of disease in those who become infected. The primary endpoint has decreased symptoms and will be associated with beneficial changes in the composition of the gut microbiome. So we also learn something about the mechanism. The study is ongoing, so stay tuned. The next indication for using on probiotics and in the context of reducing the risk is uh, the use for allergy prevention. Uh, we know that there are studies showing microbiota alteration in infancy, that they are associated with allergic diseases, with food allergic, with atopic dermatitis, with asthma. And the reason I am, I am uh, discussing is uh, uh, allergy and probiotics is that there is a very recent document from EAKI, European Academy of Allergy and Clinical Immunology, 
which looked at the uh, preventive uh, nutritional interventions for preventing uh, food allergy, IgE-mediated food allergy, and among others, also probiotics, prebiotics, and symbiotics were discussed. Well, it may be a little bit disappointing for you, but there is no recommendation for or against probiotics, prebiotics, or symbiotics with a low certainty of evidence, and it applies to pregnant and or breastfeeding women and or infants. However, we know that probiotics, also prebiotics and symbiotics are very, this is a question that people all very often ask, parents are asking. So what should be the practical approach? Well, I think it's as always, it's important to discuss. It seems reasonable to discuss with care providers, current evidence, regarding specific probiotics, prebiotics, or symbiotics, and let them decide whether the expected benefits are in line with their expectation and where the cost incurred. So discussion is important. And finally, another indication which I would like to call, uh, discuss in the, concept of, in the context of reducing the risk is necrotizing enterocolitis. Necrotizing enterocolitis, which is severe de debilitating disease in very low preterm uh, infants, very low birth weight uh, infants, preterm infants. 30 to 50% of those infants will require surgery and 30% may die. So we want to reduce the risk of, uh, of, of this um, devastating disease. And, um, and there is, we, we, even if we don't know the pathogenesis of necrotizing enterocolitis, we know that microbiota may play a role, hence the discussion about the role of probiotics. There are two recent documents, guidelines from two societies, ESPEGAN and AGA, American Gastroenterology Association. And as you can see, there are differences. Within the ESPEGAN, we recommended two probiotics, one a single probiotic and one a combination of strains, but we also formulated recommendation no against or did not formulate a recommendation for, one, for some of the probiotics. In contrast, American Gastroenterology Association provided a much longer list of those Positive, uh, positive recommendation. So why both guidelines were based on a per-wise systematic review and network meta-analysis, their conclusions differ. And then there's an important question, what to do when the probiotic recommendations from medical organizations do not agree? Well, luckily enough, at least one probiotic was indicated in both guidelines from ESPEGAN and from AGA. And this is the only probiotic that was recommended by both societies is l rhamnosus GG. So this is the one which can be chosen. However, things are never easy. And only very recently, this new clinical report from American Academy of Pediatrics was published. And the conclusion is evidence does not support routine probiotic use in preterm infants particularly those with birth weight infants below 1,000 grams. Because a pharmaceutical-grade probiotic product is not available in the U.S. and long-term safety is unknown, the report advises against routine universal use of probiotics in preterm infants. Clinicians must be aware of the lack of regulatory standards for this preparation. Of course, American uh, APA, American Pediatric Association, is mainly dealing with, with um, uh, issues um, for, for, for their population. But I think it's important for all of us, the quality and safety of probiotic products really matter, especially when we want to use them in preterm infants. But of course, but these discordant uh, recommendations do not guide us, do not help us in, uh, in everyday life. So I discussed some of, the, uh, some of the indications for the use of probiotics. And now let me briefly talk about symbiotics. And again, I will explain why I have chosen symbiotics. First, there is a very recent consensus statement on the symbiotics with the updated definition of what are symbiotics. And it's a mixture comprising life microorganisms and substrates selectively utilized by host microorganisms that confers a health benefit on the host. And there are two approaches, complementary symbiotic 
and synergistic uh, symbiotic. If you want to read more details, it's an open access uh, document consensus statement, so you can read more in, the, in, in, in this document. But the reason I'm calling your attention to symbiotics is because we are talking about the reduction in the risk of the diseases. And this study shows that symbiotic may help prevent neonatal sepsis. Large randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial with more than 4,500 participants performed in, in India. And this study showed that this particular combination, because what was used here is important, uh, uh, reduce the risk of uh, neonatal um, sepsis reduction by 40%. So it shows us what are the, what are the uh, options, the potential with the use at least of some of the symbiotics. So my summary number two for this part of my presentation is beneficial effects of biotics are possible. However, each biotic needs to be evaluated separately in the context of efficacy as well as safety. So going back to the question which I asked at the beginning, targeting that gut microbiota to reduce the risk of the disease, where are we now? As I said at the beginning, we are in the midst of the microbiome revolution. And it comes across microbiome, microbiota, those two terms are being used interchangeably, and also uh, in the context of that modification of the gut microbiota. But it's important to remember that no single intervention will act as a magic bullet. One should be realistic. Simplistic concept of how a given supplement or medication might influence a microbiota, host interface, have generated much hope and even more disappointment. Again, no single intervention will act as a magic bullet. And second, there are challenges ahead. There is a lot of interaction possible between the, uh, the host, between the diet, genome, and appreciation of this range of positive interaction between an intervention, host diet, genome, immune system, and also with resident comments on, should alert one to, of, to the challenges that lie ahead. But, but difficult roads often lead to beautiful destination. This is what I hope will happen with our microbiota research. And with this, I thank you very much for your attention.